instead of 9 o'clock. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. It's not fair at the 11 o'clock either. <laughs> I have often thought that those in Metropolitan Community Church who come from a Catholic background get a little shortchanged around here. It is true that in all MCCs there is a mix of folks who come from Protestant and Catholic backgrounds. And I think this congregation might just be pretty close to 50-50, which is a little bit unusual even in MCC. But you know, you just can't get around the fact that MCC was started by an Assemblies of God Pentecostal preacher. Amen. Defrocked for being gay. <laughs> <laughs> and you really can't get around Troy Perry. He has got a big, booming voice, and that's just his style. And so many times in MCC, we'll be singing some hymn that we, who are you know, maybe from a Baptist or a Methodist background, we're just singing our hearts out, and we're so full of the Spirit, and the folks who are from Catholic churches are just going... <laughs> <laughs> And it's not fair, but today is different. Today it's the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians who might just be scratching their heads and saying, huh? Because today, as it's probably clear by now, is all about Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Go Mary. Go, <laughs> go Mary. And on this All Saints Day, let us remember that she really is the mother of all saints. And so today, as we are continuing our sermon series based on John McNeil's book, Taking a Chance on God, we're going to take a look at what he has to say about Mary. And I believe it really is true that no matter what our religious background, Catholic or Protestant or all the above or none of the above, Mary really can have a very special place in our spiritual life. And that's what we're going to consider today. Will you pray with me, please? Holy Mary, Mother of God, we invite you fully into this place with us today. We invite you with all of your tender compassion and your fierce protectiveness. We invite you who raised Jesus, the Word made flesh, who carried on his ministry after his resurrection, we invite you to be here in our hearts, in our thoughts, in these words, that we might see God through you, a vision of God that we need and that our world needs. So Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, our Father and our Mother. Amen. Amen. Well, based largely on Catholic tradition, Mary is known by a number of different names. You may have your favorite. There is, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary. There is the word in Greek that, you know, doesn't happen in everyday conversation called Theotokos, which means the Mother of God. There is, of course, Madonna, the original, <laughs> before that other one began voguing her way into our lives. And then there is, of course, Our Lady, as in Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility, the Catholic Church from Lake Wobegon, that mystical town from the Prairie Home Companion, if you're familiar with that. <laughs> but by whatever name we call her, John McNeil, who was a Jesuit priest, who was defrocked for coming out as gay and for the things that he taught affirming the spirituality of gay people. John McNeil says, I've always had a strong intuition that there is a special relationship between Mary and those of us who are a part of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. And if you are here today in this room, you are a part of that community and a very welcome part. Now some of John's reasons for this intuition on his part are very personal. He was raised as a devout Catholic. His mother was actually named Mary, and she died when he was three years old. And from a very young age, he was taught that his mother, his human mother, Mary, was in heaven, praying for him, 
praying for his protect protection. So his feelings for his human mother, Mary, very naturally became deeply tied to his feelings for Mary, the mother of God. But he also goes on in the chapter in his book about Mary to talk about the relationship specifically between Mary and gay men. He addresses that stereotype that I'm sure most of us are probably familiar with about the reason men become gay is because they have overbearing, overprotective mothers and distant fathers. And he says the truth, of course, which is that this is not the cause of homosexuality, but more often the result of a man being gay. That often, as gay men grow up, their fathers become more distant, who struggle more to deal with their son's gayness. And the fact that their son may be more deeply connected to their feminine side. And in that, then there also becomes a deep relationship between a gay son and his mother. His mother who may represent the maternal side of God, more loving, kind, merciful, non-judgmental, compassionate, someone easily approachable, someone who is affirming and accepting of just who you are. And now I just want to stress that this is not the case in every gay man's life. You know, humanity is a huge population and we all have different stories. But stereotypes just about always have the kernels of truth in them. And this is the truth for many gay men, the kind of relationship they have with their mothers. And so he talks about this and how this often makes gay men more connected to Mary, the mother of God. He also says it's probably why there is possibly this deep unconscious reason why gay men refer to each other as Mary. Mary. <laughs> oh, Mary! That's why that's the title of my sermon, Oh, Mary. <laughs> But he points out that gay men often use it as a put-down, as a way to make fun of that, perhaps, more feminine side. That's the nice word. There are other words our world likes to use, but I won't. But he says that word actually points to that feminine side that gay men can bring into being men. Just as lesbians often have a masculine side they can bring into being women. It's often how gay and lesbian people meld gender regardless of our bodies, that we bring the masculine and feminine into the world in different ways. And he says this, men, gay men calling each other Mary is a way to recognize that, but wouldn't it be great if instead of using it as a put down, it was actually used as a blessing. Amen. To say, wow, Mary. <laughs> nice floral print today. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> Our world needs more feminine beauty that is honored. And I think that all of what John says rings true. And I have to confess that as a lesbian woman, it was also hard for me to relate to much of what he was saying. Because let's just say that whole libraries could be written about the complicated relationships of lesbians to their mothers. Can I get a witness? All right. All right. Oh, I know you're out there. Come on, give me more than that. <laughs> Whole libraries. Complicated relationships that are often not very pretty. Too often, I think lesbian women feel like we are a disappointment to our mothers who just have no clue what to do with us. And again, not always. We all have different stories. And yes, and I'll tell you what. My mother did not know what to do with me. <laughs> I didn't want to wear makeup, I didn't want to date boys, and I wanted to wear boys' clothes. This was a woman raised in the Depression. She had no clue what to do with me. And so no matter what I did, there was always this element of disappointment, this element of not being able to understand one another or even communicate together. That nurturing that we all hope comes with mothering was very difficult. And I know that she loved me, but she was not non-judgmental, and she was not particularly warm and fuzzy, and she was not easily approachable. For me, that was my dad. I got my mothering through my father, mm -hmm. which again shows that gender does not have to define who we receive our parenting from. But regardless who it comes from, we all need mothering. I needed more mothering. And as I grew up in my spiritual journey, I've always wanted to be closer to God the mother. Always wanted to be closer to Mary. 
but I've always struggled with that because of my own relationship with my mother, and it has been very difficult for me to be able to relate to Mary, and I have often envied many of my Catholic sisters and brothers <coughs> who it just seems like it's as natural as breathing. So maybe you're in the same place like me, maybe not. No matter what your gender or sexual orientation, I'm quite sure we all have our own experience or the lack thereof of our parents, of being parented, of being mothered, of being fathered. If you were a gay man, maybe you have a fabulous relationship with your mother, maybe you don't. Maybe you have an intimate relationship with Mary, the mother of God, maybe you don't. All that can be true no matter what your gender or sexual orientation. Maybe you're in the same boat as John McNeil and you have a very intimate relationship with Mary. Whoever we are, wherever we are in our relationship with her, there are wonderful dimensions to her that I think can add so much to our spiritual life. And I want to talk about some of those today related to the story that we heard from the Gospel of John. And I will confess, when I was preaching at the 9 o'clock service, I felt like such a Baptist trying to preach about Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so hang with me, if you will. Let's take a look at this story from the Gospel of John that we heard today about this wedding that Jesus was at. It's in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. <coughs> In John's Gospel, Mary is referred to only twice, and neither time is she referred to by name, just as Jesus' mother. And on the surface, this story looks like another story about Jesus performing a miracle. Jesus and his mother Mary and the disciples, they are at a wedding early on in his ministry, and horror of horrors, the host runs out of wine. It would be like inviting all 30 of your family members to a big Thanksgiving dinner at your house and you run out of turkey. It's just not done. It's a terrible thing to have happen. So Mary feels sorry for the host. She goes to Jesus and says they're out of wine. Jesus has them fill up six huge jars that are so big they hold 180 gallons, and he turns the wine into, as he turns the water into wine, into really excellent quality wine. Or if you are in recovery, let's think of it as the best non-alcoholic sparkling cider ever. <laughs> and the party goes on, and the host is saved from great embarrassment. That's what the story is if you look at it like a story about a wedding miracle. And that's certainly one thing that it is. But if you go deeper with it, it means so much more. The story is really about a cosmically powerful mother interceding on our behalf. And here's why. The Gospel of John was actually written about a hundred years after Jesus walked on this earth. So everyone who knew him personally had died by then, and it was the next generation of Christians who were struggling to survive, and they were struggling a lot, because the persecutions of Christians was ramping up right about 100 AD in a terrible way. And it was a very dangerous thing to be a Christian back then. So here were these folks. They were living about 70 years after the resurrection but they were trying to keep the hope of the resurrection alive. Have you ever had an experience in your life that just filled you with excitement and passion and hope and, oh, this is great and this is going to be wonderful, but then as time passes, that feeling just gets less and less and less? Has anyone ever had that feeling? Are you with me? Are you sure? <laughs> That's what these people were going through. They had had this wonderful experience. They had been taught about this wonderful experience, that Jesus had conquered death. And they're living in the midst of death. You know, persecution back then was a serious deal. It wasn't a parking ticket. It was death in horrible ways if you were found out to be a Christian. And they were losing their grip on that joy and that hope and that strength. That's the reality they were living in. And that was the reality of the people who were first reading this story we heard today. You have to hear it with their ears to really get what it means. Because the story starts with the words, on the third day. Just out of the blue, if you read it, it says, on the third day. On the third day of what? Why would he say that? It's on the third day, Jesus and Mary and the disciples went to a wedding. And the reason is that <laughs> on the third day was the clue to all those people that were reading it a hundred years after Jesus, that this story was about them. On the third day, Jesus rose on the third day. On the third day, 
means life after the resurrection. All the people who lived after the resurrection happened. So this story is for all those who are living after Jesus rose on the third day. And on the third day, they went to a wedding. Well, it wasn't just any wedding. This wedding, anytime wedding is used in the Bible, and it's used constantly, the wedding was really the symbol for the dominion of God to come after the Messiah came. It's how we all should be living in a time of celebration and great joy, in a time of people coming together to celebrate and to feast, at a place where there is marriage equality for everyone. Yeah. Everyone has an equal place at the table, at God's wedding banquet feast. Everyone is invited. No one is left out. So John is writing these people who are suffering, and he's saying to all of you who are living after the resurrection, in this time that feels anything like a wedding, Jesus and Mary are at the wedding that never ends. And Mary comes to Jesus and says they are out of wine. She wasn't talking about that they were out of some liquid to drink. Wine is the symbol for joy. It's the symbol for hope and for life and for passion. And she is saying, Jesus, your followers are out of joy. Your followers are out of passion. They're out of strength. They're out of life. They're out of hope. Do something. And Jesus says, Woman? Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> if I had ever called my mother woman, <laughs> I would have gotten slapped into next week and made grounded for the rest of my life. And, he, he was there. Okay. and I've often thought this was very disrespectful of Jesus, but I read a few interpreters, and I think I can hang with this interpretation. That Jesus used that phrase because he was really trying to address her as an equal. Not as his mother, not as... A woman who is beneath him, because that's who mothers and all women were at that time, but as woman, as her own being. And I think that rings true because there's only one other time in the Gospel of John that Jesus refers to Mary as woman. And it's when he's dying on the cross, mm -hmm. and he wants her to be cared for. And he looks at her and he says, woman, behold your son. Mm -hmm. And he looks to the beloved disciple and he's saying to each of them, take care of each other. I give you now to each other. So he's saying to her, woman, he even brings her completely in with him. He says, woman, what has this to do with you and me? Not just, well, what does this have to do with me? He says, what does this have to do with you and me? And she's saying it has everything to do with you and me, Jesus, because your followers are dying on the vine. And they need more hope. The writer of the Gospel of John uses Mary to paint a bridge, to build a bridge from Jesus, who is living before the resurrection, to those folks who are living all those years after the resurrection. He builds that bridge and says, no, we're supposed to continue living in God's wedding. We're supposed to remember that all of us are invited to the wedding. And the emperor and all those people who are trying to kill us and deny us our rights and keep us in our place and destroy us. They're not going to have the upper hand because when we follow Jesus, we are creating God's banquet of life for all people who are all invited. And Mary is in there saying, Jesus, provide more hope for your people. She says this with utter confidence. She just, she just looks at him and she says, well, they're out of wine. They're out. She doesn't say do something. She doesn't say, you know, she doesn't instruct him on what to do. She just says that. And she says it with utter confidence. And guess what? What does Jesus do? He may have said, well, woman, what does that have to do with us? But then he turns right around and he gets the job done. He calls the servants and he says, bring these jars and fill them up with water. 180 <coughs> gallons of water. That's a lot. And he fills them up not just with any old wine, but the very best very best joy, the very best hope, the very best love for his people hundreds of years later who were living in such a difficult time. And he does it because Mary, I believe, is in charge. She does all this with such utter confidence. This is Mary, not the 14-year-old unwed mother. 
who you see looking demurely down in statuary and churches, who's always so meek and mild. That is not this Mary. This is the Mary who is herself a sexual outlaw. Mary could have been killed for being an unwed mother in her time. Mm -hmm. She was a sexual outlaw who fully identified herself with the outcasts and with the poor and with the powerless and those who were oppressed. And says, Jesus, take care of them. This is the Mary who is a virgin in the most ancient meaning of the word. In the most ancient meanings of the word virgin, the definition is a woman who is not owned by any man. It is a woman who is completely self-determined. And Mary was self-determined in this story as she was looking out for you and for me. And Jesus does exactly what she expects him to do with abundance. 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 <laughs> it's almost like what Sarah Helen said in her translation. It is Mary who owns Jesus. That Jesus belongs to her. And she intercedes on our behalf with him. This is who Mary is. If you got any instruction about Mary at all, like if it were me, you got nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. She got a little appearance on Christmas Eve, and that was it. But this is who Mary really is, this powerful mother on our side who wants the very best for us, who knows when we are struggling, who is always looking out for us, who wants us to know that we are loved, who wants our lives to overflow with abundant joy. Don't we all need a mother like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And God bless you if you have one. And if you don't, you do anyway. Her name is Mary. And then there's another role that Mary plays that John McNeil highlights that I think is especially important for those of us who might struggle with either our image of God or our image of Jesus. If you were given an image of God as a judgmental father, or maybe you were given an image of Jesus as an unapproachable male figure, if you were given an image of either one of those or a relationship that made you feel afraid, this is where Mary can step in. And I think especially for GLBT people, too often we have been told that we are an abomination in God the Father's sight. This is especially important for us because this is where Mary, by her Greek name, can be so helpful. That word I mentioned at the beginning, theotokos, Theotokos is often translated as the mother of God, but theotokos really means bearer of God, meaning that Mary literally bears God to us yes. as God the mother, as a God with a maternal side. She can be to all of us the face of God, whether male or female, whatever works for you but with those mothering qualities that are more about nurturing and compassion and kindness and protection and soothing when we're afraid. But to do this, for her to help us, we have to be open to her. And this is where I have struggled the most. And what I have found the most helpful in this is prayer in all its many forms. For John McNeil, it was often in Catholic prayers, like the Hail Mary, and just because we can, and just because we never do, let's say the Hail Mary together. And if you don't know it, just listen to your Catholic brothers and sisters next to you, and they will teach us for a change. So, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour. <laughs> when John McNeil prays now and at the hour of our death though he wasn't kidding John McNeil as I've mentioned before was a prisoner of war during World War II and when he was a prisoner of war he was sent with other prisoners to Berlin 
during the bombing raids by Allied forces over Germany, and he was forced to dig bodies out of the rubble and bury them. And the German guards would not let the prisoners sleep in bomb shelters at night, and airplanes would be flying overhead and bombs dropping everywhere. And to put himself to sleep at night, he would remember much of the poetry he had to memorize in Catholic school growing up. And the one that helped him the most was the one that Bob read from the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. O oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole, to Mary Queen the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. He would say this to himself over and over again, and he found that as long as he did, he could go to sleep, even with airplanes roaring overhead and bombs dropping all around him. He felt the protection of his mother Mary around him. I've never been in that terrifying of a situation, but I have learned in my spiritual journey that I need God as both a father and a mother. <coughs> and I've found that prayers can come in all kinds of forms, and when it comes to trying to connect with God, our mother, and with Mary, the mother of God, and all of us, are the most helpful thing. So I'm going to close with this song. If you know it, please feel free to sing along, because then I won't be singing by myself. <clears throat> like a ship in the harbor, like a mother and child, like a stream in the